Let's pray together. We are glorying in our Redeemer, Father, which is what you sent him into the world to bring about. This is a little foretaste from our less than perfect hearts of what we were made for perfectly in heaven and on the new earth. And so keep fanning that flame of glorying in, boasting in, trusting in, delighting in, being satisfied in our great Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And tonight from this text, teach us to love one another without hypocrisy, I pray. Don't just teach us, Lord. Make it happen. Let the teaching be of a spiritual kind that has the power of the Holy Spirit behind it so that the fruit of the Holy Spirit called love, free from dissimulation and hypocrisy, would happen in this church. Through Christ I pray, amen. Well, let's begin with some biblical thoughts about how to read the Bible in such a way that it changes us, especially a text like this that Chris just read here, and I'm not sure who read it on Sunday morning. By the way, I wouldn't even begin to guess how many times you're going to hear this text read in the next year. Um, But this would be a golden opportunity to memorize Romans 12 as a church. And we're going to read it over and over and over again in the prayer that God would make it happen in this church. So if you haven't begun to memorize it on this very slow journey through Romans 12, it's not too late to start. I'm asking this question at the beginning of this message because... When you read, just say five verses, verses 9 through 13, there are 13 exhortations in those five verses. How do you read those? What do you do with them in your devotions? Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, seek to show hospitality. That's 13 specific admonitions or exhortations. So suppose you get up in the morning like a good Christian and you have set yourself to begin the day by reading your Bible. You should do that. It's a good idea. I do that. I think Those who want to walk through the day in the power of the Spirit set themselves to begin the day by reading the Bible. So you've set yourself to read, among other chapters, perhaps Romans 12. Takes you maybe three minutes to read this chapter at a nice leisurely pace. So you've spent maybe 15 seconds on that list that I just read to you in verses 9 to 13. Do you get up from your knees or up from your chair just totally transformed and fired up to be transformed in your love, your hate, your brotherly affection, your honoring of others, your zeal, your fervency, your service, your hope, your joy, your patience, your prayer, your generosity, and your hospitality. I'm a new man. I am now red hot in all those 13 wonderful Christian virtues. Thank you for helping me read my Bible this morning. It doesn't work like that. So what's the point of reading your Bible? I mean, if to read these these 13 things, get up from your knees, and uh, I mean, how many of them can you even keep in your head, let alone in your heart? What do you do with them? They're just in, and maybe you remember one or two. By, By the time after breakfast, they're gone. And what was the good of reading those 13 admonitions, not to mention all the others in the chapter, not to mention the other chapters that you read hurriedly on your way through the reading program like I do on the way to reading the whole Bible in a year. So to get help, let's ask that question to Paul. Say, Paul, what did you write those for? I mean, how are they supposed to change us? It doesn't work. I mean, you read them, spend 15 seconds on them, and 
You get up and nothing is new. So let's go to chapter 15 and see what Paul says about that issue. Chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. I just want to get a handle on what do you do with parts of the Bible that are bullets. Boom, 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 boom. And you read them and they they just go in and out and you're off to work. And I mean, was anything supposed to happen with those 13 exhortations? Are you supposed to be new? Are you supposed to be better at those having read them? Well, yes, you are. We're supposed to be better at them for having read them. So let's read verses 15 and 16 of Romans 15. On some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder. So don't think you should only read new things in the Bible. The Bible is for old Christians like me Mainly reminder, I've read this book dozens and dozens of times. I've read everything in this book dozens and dozens of times. There's nothing new in this book in my ears. There's plenty new for my head and my heart. If I had eyes to see, and I'm always praying for better eyes to see, but the Bible is real plain. It's all about reminder when you read your Bible as a veteran Christian. On some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given to me by God. So thank, this is a work of grace that he's writing to us. Let's receive the grace of the Bible. Verse 16, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. That's us mainly. There may be some Jewish people here, but mainly we're non-Jews and uh, Jewish by inheritance through Christ. He's writing to Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. So he's like a priest, and he's getting an offering ready for God. Who's the offering? That's us. So that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable. Now stop there. Let's get the flow. I'm writing. Grace has been given to me to write. I'm an apostle. I write with authority. I've, I've, I'm helping make the Bible happen. So that... I'm in the middle of verse 16. The offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable. That word uh, doesn't ring any bell from chapter 12. Acceptable, acceptable. Verse 2, prove what is acceptable. The word is written to help us be transformed in our minds that we may prove what is acceptable. Embrace the will of God. Become a more fitting sacrifice, living sacrifice offered up in worship. Verse 1. And then this last phrase changes everything. Sanctified by the Holy Spirit. All right. Now we've got the great reformed pair. Word, verse 15, I write. Spirit, verse 16. The only way anybody gets changed in a Christ-exalting way is by word and spirit, word and spirit, word and spirit. We read, and reading doesn't change anybody. And the Spirit won't change you apart from the Word. He inspired it. He means to use it. That's why they're coming together around this phrase, so that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable. And at one side, you've got the Word working, and at the other side, you've got the Spirit working, and therefore... We got, some, we got some issues as to how to deal with this text now. And let me suggest three. Number one, this is inferences I'm drawing from Romans 15, 15 and 16 for how to read Romans 12. Number one, we pray as we read, asking the Holy Spirit to illumine our minds, change our hearts, and cause something to happen, some divine transaction to happen by means of the Word anointed by the Spirit. We don't read our Bibles mechanically. We don't read them merely intellectualistically. We, We say, oh Lord, as I begin to read, make what is there happen. We do, we do the Saint Augustine thing. Remember that old famous saying, Lord, command what thou wilt and grant what thou commandest. That's a prayer. 
Go ahead, have at me in Romans 12, 20, 25, boom, 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 boom. Change, 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 Piper. Be a different kind of person than the way you were born. And Augustine heard all that, and he knew he couldn't. He couldn't. I mean, words, 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 words. Don't change anybody, not in a Christ-exalting way. But if by God's grace, through prayer, Grant what thou commandest. You say be holy, with, I mean be loving without dissimulation, without hypocrisy in a genuine way. You say become a loving person. I pause and I say, God, make it happen. Oh God, don't leave me to myself. Make it happen. So the word teams up through prayer with the Holy Spirit and things happen inside. Second, we look away to Jesus when we read commands of the Bible. I'm drawing verse 3 down into verse 9 now. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Rather, think this way. Think according to the measure of faith you've been given. Think faith. Think faith. Faith is looking away to Jesus. So when a command comes, do I look in here for resources? No. I look out there for resources. I look to Jesus and the reason that is so crucial with regard to the Holy Spirit is this. John 16, 14, Jesus says, I will send the Spirit to you, and He will glorify me. The Spirit did not come to make much of you. He came to make much of Jesus. Therefore, when you are set on making much of Jesus, He'll help you. If you say, okay, I can't love the way I ought to love. I'm a hypocrite to the core. I've been playing games all my life. Now, Jesus, you died for me. You modeled this for me. And you're the reason I exist. I look away from this paltry heart of mine to you. When the Holy Spirit sees you do that, boom, he's on you. Because he will make much of Jesus. He loves to magnify Jesus. If he sees anybody saying, for Jesus' sake, make me a loving person. Leaning on Jesus, make me a loving person. After the model of Jesus, make me a loving person. The Holy Spirit will be all over you because he loves to magnify Jesus. Third, we will not rush. We will meditate. And I know it's hard to read through the whole Bible when you read the Bible this way. Uh, but work that out. I got no answers for you. I believe we should read the Bible fast, and I believe we should read the Bible slow. I believe you ought to get through it in a year, and I believe you ought to meditate on this verse all day long. <laughs> and how you do that for every verse in the Bible, I don't have any idea. And the Holy Spirit will just have to be with you in that and show you what verses to meditate on that you need all day long today. But you got to slow down. You just got to slow down in reading the Bible in order for this verse and all these 13 commands to have any effect on you. Picture it this way. This, this image is old with me. I'm not making this up for this sermon. I've been walking with this image for years and years, teaching me how to read my Bible. Uh, 747, I think I made up this image when that plane was built. Can you remember the jumbo jet? First time it ever came out. So now we're flying over, we're flying over, oh, let's say Florida. In a 747, 560 miles an hour. And you see down there an orange grove. And you say, whoa, that's a beautiful orange grove. And that's the way most people read their Bible. Whoosh, that's a beautiful set of trees down there in Romans 12. Man, those really would have an effect if I could get down there and eat. So you just land the plane, land the plane. You get out of the plane, get on your, whoops, my little thing here just fell off. Uh, you, what's this thing? Oops. Whoops. Wait a minute. Got to get my phone out of my pocket. Sorry. Let's try that. You land your plane, okay? You're on your two feet now, and, uh, and you're walking through the grove. And you're pausing at every tree, or some of the trees. And you're reaching up, and you're plucking a fruit. And you're looking at it. It's beautiful. Admiring the fruit. God inspired this, Romans 12, 9, fruit. And then you... You bite into it. Well, if it's an orange, you wouldn't want to peel it first and then take the pieces and eat it. That's the way you've got to read your Bible. You've got to. Uh, you've got to read it fast. You've got to read it slow. You've got to slow down here, eat the fruit. And it's called 
There's a name for this? Meditation. It's called meditation. And it means asking lots of questions and thinking through the answers, and that's what I'm going to help you do for the next who knows how many weeks. So I see all of that implied in Romans 15, 15, and 16. Let's go to Romans 12, 9. One phrase for this time together. Let love be genuine, ESV. Old King James, let love be without dissimulation. The word is on hypocritos, not a hypocritos. Hear it? Not a hypocrite. Talk. Not a hypocrite. Same in Greek as it is in English. Without hypocrisy. So I'm going to work with you. I'm just going to, I'm going to sit on this and eat this fruit, this one piece of fruit tonight, because I would love for our church to be less hypocritical. I just assume we're all hypocrites, me too. I would like all hypocrisy out of my life. So I need to dig here. I need to chew here. I need to savor here with you about this half of a verse. Have we begun a new section here? Most Bible translations put a paragraph break, and kind of, I wonder. You're talking about spiritual gifts in verses 6 through 8, and then he says, let love be genuine. Does that remind you of anything? Gifts love, gifts love. Does it remind you of anything anywhere? Like 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, 1 Corinthians 12, all about gifts, 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 and at the end of chapter 12, now I will show you a more excellent way. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic power so as to understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. So, so Paul seems to do it this way. Let's talk about gifts, now love. Let's talk about gifts, now love. So in a sense, yeah, there's a break. There's like a break there. On the other hand, I don't think so. Because verses 2 and 3 are fine in their way. Verse 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is acceptable, the will of God. Now he's unpacking that for us, and he unpacked it with humility in verse 3 and looking away from ourselves and being self-forgetful as we delight in Christ and spill over in gifts to one another. And now he says, love. And if you just, if you forget about the paragraph break, you'd read it like this, wouldn't you? You'd say, I'm starting in the middle of verse 8. Contri those who contribute, be generous. And those who lead, do it with zeal. And those who are merciful, be merciful cheerfully. And those who love, do it without hypocrisy. No break. One of the reasons I think that is, is just asking, okay, what's hypocrisy got to do with verse 3? Don't think of yourself too highly. Think in terms of the measure of faith that's been given to you, which looks away from you, forgets about yourself, is enthralled with Jesus and spills over in joy onto other peoples and meets their needs. It's all about forgetting ourselves. Well, what's hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is all about me. Hypocrisy is all about me and making sure I make the best impression I can without any regard to what's inside of me. I just want you to see the best, whether there's anything good in here or not. And so I'm just constantly a second-hander. I'm just strategizing myself to move through life to, oh, what do they expect? Oh, I'll give them that. And what do they expect? I'll give them that. And what do they expect? I'll give them that. And you're one colossal fake. And that's all about the opposite of verse 3. So I don't think Paul's on a new paragraph here. I, don't, I think he's just, he's got the same issue with love as he had with the gifts. Namely, let's do them in a verse 3 way, not thinking highly of ourselves. Let's just get this self-issue out of our lives, be enthralled with Jesus, which produces an absolutely transparent person. I got nothing to hide you know my sins, you know my weaknesses, you know my strengths. I'm just plain old me. Take it or leave it. Jesus has taken it. That's all I need. 
Your approval is neither here nor there. It's just a wonderful way to live. It's the free, happy, serving way to live because you're not using other people to prop up your ego all the time. You're there for other people because Christ has taken you in. So we're going to linger over this and talk about, okay, what would love look like if it's not hypocritical? And to answer that, you have to say, what is hypocrisy? So let's look at two uh, things or ways that hypocrisy shows itself, look at two motives of hypocrisy, and then close with a, a call to Bethlehem to not love this way, love without hypocrisy. Okay? Way number one that hypocrisy shows itself. It tries to make the outside look better than the inside puts a loving exterior. Remember that awful verse in 1 Corinthians 13, 3? Though I give away all that I have and deliver my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing, which means you can do some pretty serious sacrificial acts on the outside and be a loveless person. Like give away all your possessions and sacrifice your body and be loveless. That's scary. Love is something deep, real, inside, or it's nothing. And therefore, hypocrisy in love is possible. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said this. Love without hypocrisy. So hypocrisy is putting on a loving veneer. Pastors can get really good at this. And inside, they don't, hate, they don't love the flock at all. In fact, they're sick of it. Just like to get out of here, but there's no job available. Or it would just be too embarrassing. There's a lot of people who've been the, done the religious thing and kind of yeah, everybody thinks they're religious and you can't bail on this. And so let's just keep that up. But inside... We've gone. It's over. And here's the way Jesus put it. This is his most classic statement on hypocrisy. Matthew 15, 7. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Lip praise is doing great. Heart praise, gone. And if you're one of those people, you got lots of lip praise tonight, maybe lip service out there in the world. And in here, it's over. There's no lip praise and lips. I mean, there's no heart praise and heart service going on. This sermon's for you. Be praying while I preach that God would work on you. I do for me. Jesus got really angry at people like this. Can't overlook that. Jesus is nice. He's a nice person but he would not have been liked by a lot of nice people because he wasn't nice the way they think you should be nice. He said things like Matthew 23, 25, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. They say this to their face. Just get this. You ever see anybody talk this way? You say, I got to give you a lesson on love, fella. This is not the way loving people talk. Well, just go to school on Jesus. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside full of greed and self-indulgence. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. Oh, he didn't like that. He got really mad at that. Talitha and I were at Pizza Hut today. And uh, I said, you know what hypocrisy is, Talitha? Mm, Not sure. I said, okay. I held up my Pepsi cup. And we had an accident in our house this morning to make this especially visible. But I held up this Pepsi cup, and I I said, just clean it up on the outside. It looks really good. Everybody looks good. It's good for drinking, right? It's good for drinking. And inside, full of dog poop. Because it's stable. Our dog had an accident this morning. So this is really right off the front burner pastoral teaching illustration along the way. Talk with your children while you walk in the way. 
So now you know what the first manifestation of hypocrisy is, putting up a good front so that nobody knows there's dog poop inside. Here's the second one. Hypocrisy shows itself by calling attention to the flaws of others to conceal our own. Now, let's read that from Luke 6. I'll just read it for you. Luke 6, 42, Jesus says, How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. So now he's using the word until we get to definition, second one. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Paul is saying, love doesn't do that. It doesn't do either one of those. It doesn't shine the outside of the cup while inside there's dog poop so that nobody knows you've really lost the faith and you're just putting up the front of love and religion. And it doesn't spend its time making sure that the other person's faults are highlighted so that nobody can see your own. I can take a little parenthesis here and talk about marriage. The main place that happens is in marriage. It happens everywhere, but the main place it happens is in marriage. And back and forth, the, the, the highlighting of the other's flaws go, right? Right? so that we don't have to deal as deeply and as seriously with our own. And if marriages, if married people would spend as much energy and earnestness and emotional effort digging deep into their own hypocrisies instead of digging deep into the other's flaws, a lot of marriages would last and be better. Let's close that. That's another sermon for another time, but... There's an application for some of you. Those are the two ways that I see hypocrisy manifesting itself in the New Testament. Here, let's turn now to the two reasons for this. What's going on here? Why do people do this? What are they after? What are we after? We all do this. We're all hypocrites. There's more or less. Why do we do it? I see two aims in the Bible. Number one, to keep to get and to keep the praise and the approval of other people. We crave. There's something in the human heart that craves the approval, the praise, the esteem of other people. Now listen to Jesus go after this one in Matthew 6. When you give to the needy, sound no trumpet, before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Verse 5, when you pray, so the first one was giving, like take care of the poor, take a box of love somewhere. I want you to do that but not as a hypocrite. Verse 5, praying, okay? I prayed here. I'll pray again. What's going on here? Public prayer in front of these several hundred folks. Verse 5, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues, the Baptist churches, and, and on the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. They get it. They get what they want. Praise, and it's over. That's what you get, period. So the first thing that hypocrisy reveals about us is a craving for praise, a craving for approval. And you may have some groups that you feel really free from. I could care less what they think. But there are a few, really a few. Boy, you want their approval. Man, you do anything to get their approval, and you're jockeying to make sure you don't say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, because there may be one guy 
one hero. Now on his approval. So the first goal is the craving of approval and praise. And Jesus says, going to go that way. You get it, and that's all you get. And Paul says, don't love like that. Don't put on the love thing. Don't do the love thing in order to meet your deep need, your craving for the approval of others. Fix that another way, which is why I said, as we move through all of these commands, I'm going to say every time, I hope, look away to Jesus, look away to Jesus, look to chapters 1 to 11, look to the cross, look to the Spirit, because that craving is not meant to be solved by hypocrisy. Like, let's all play games and have our approval needs met, right? Would you have succeeded if you did hypocrisy so well that everybody liked you today and you went to bed, oh, today I was totally successful? Really? Is that what life is about? Becoming so good at our hypocrisy that we get everything we want? No. The healing we need comes from Jesus alone. That craving is a signal that we don't see him, we don't savor him, we're not satisfied by him, he hasn't become our treasure, we're not resting in him, our roots haven't gone down deep enough into the cross and into grace. The whole issue of let love be without hypocrisy is do you know Jesus well and do you love him much? That's the issue. It's going to be the issue with every one of these commandments. It's going to be all about are you satisfied with Jesus? Not, can you screw up enough moral wherewithal to pull off the display? We're not going to be that kind of church. If it's not there, confess to your small group. It's not there. They won't kick you out. They do. I'm kicking them out. Or at least I'll ask the elders to. We just don't do it that way. You're just going to be honest there. That's got to be a safe place so we can get on each other, pray, and help us forward. Here's the second one, and uh, we're almost done. The second thing that hypocrisy is driven by, this is a little, a little surprising to me as I poked around in the teachings of Jesus and Paul to figure out what is this thing being driven by. Now, the second thing is not so much I want the approval of others as is I want to conceal something that has really nothing to do with the behavior I'm presently doing. Hypocrisy often is, I want to look like I'm loving when I'm not loving. But hypocrisy often is, I want to put up this front because there's a totally different issue going on in my life. And if I can, if I can do this, they'll never suspect that. It's very different. I'll show you where I got that. Let me just read for you. I'll tell you the story. Jesus sees a woman bent over like this. She can't stand up. 18 years, she's like this. He has compassion on her. His heart goes out to this woman. And it's Sunday. I mean, it's Saturday. It's Sabbath day, right? Oh, dear. It's Sabbath day. Here's a woman who needs help. And is Jesus going to hedge and say, well, come back on Sunday and we'll fix this? No. That's not the way he is. Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You want to love people on Sunday? Love people on Sunday. I don't care what you do. So he, he goes and he touches her and, and she stands up straight and, and gives glory to God. And the ruler of the synagogue is bent out of shape and says, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. I mean, just imagine what's going on in this man's heart. Imagine the cesspool of this man's heart, this religious man's heart. We keep the rules here. It's a cesspool under there. Now, how does Jesus go after it? And this is where I got this insight into what, what's driving this man. Jesus says, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox? or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? That's all he says. What's that about? What's driving this man? 
This religious man, this ruler of the synagogue, this man who wants to get the Sabbath just right, what's driving this man? You know what it is? Money. Money. The God of money. Oh, yeah. When it's your donkey that might die of thirst on Sunday, you'll take him to water. When it's your ox that just might keel over on a hot Judean Sunday afternoon, you'll guide him to water. Yes, you will, because your money's at stake. Jesus was so angry. It says in Luke 18, 16, explicitly, the Pharisees were lovers of money. <laughs> and you read these stories, and you say, whoa, where'd that come from? I didn't know it had anything to do with money. It looked like it had to do with Sabbath keeping. That's not what's driving these men. I did a funeral this morning. And I got to be careful here. I don't want to offend anybody. But, and I, I say it with just overflowing love and longing. If, if they hear this tape or if they're in this room, some at the funeral were not believers. And they made it real clear in a most honest and humble way that they were not. I knew that was the case. And therefore, since they were honest, I was honest. And I, I shared right up front about that. And I knew that behind this unbelief in large measure was the church had just so let these people down. In fact, I could hear the unbelievers as I talked about Jesus over against the church saying, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you ever have any amens from unbelievers? Start preaching Jesus and not religion. Start preaching Jesus and not church. And unbelievers say, hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're the problem. Our love affair with money, our love affair with our stuff, we are such hypocrites when it comes to our religion. So, closing, Bethlehem, Bethlehem. Beware of making our religion a cloak for worldliness. Liberals are good at this. And fundamentalists and evangelicals are good at this. Liberals talking endlessly about the poor and about peace and about the environment and sleeping around on the weekends. Because it's the big issues of justice that matter. My little personal morality doesn't matter. Adultery, fornication, pornography, not a problem. I'm fighting for the poor. That's one way to be a hypocrite. And then there's a fundamentalistic and an evangelical way to be a, a hypocrite, too. Talking endlessly about the cesspool of modern culture and the godlessness of secular humanism and hiding away in our little safe suburban or urban homes with surround sound entertainment and $25,000 cars tooling around, not lifting one finger for the poor. We got our evangelical ways of being hypocrites. So this thing cuts right through everybody's heart. This is not choosing Republicans and Democrats, hypocrites on both sides, pastors and people, hypocrites on both sides. This sword cuts right through the human heart, not through groups of people, through every group of people, through every human heart, because we are all hypocrites. And my longing and my prayer is that this verse, this tree, this fruit that we've lingered over now for some time, oh, Holy Spirit, come. Let's just do our, do our Bible reading thing. Come and cut us. We prayed downstairs just before we came up. It's a risky prayer. Do whatever you have to do. I said to me, to this church, to free us from every form of hypocrisy. Whatever disease, whatever Whatever it takes, free me as a pastor from every form of hypocrisy. I hope you're willing to pray a prayer like that and risk your life. If he has to take me out, I was running on my, my uh, running machine this morning. My heart's just going 200 miles an hour. And every time my heart's at that pace and I'm breathing so heavy at 58, I say, Lord... If it would benefit the church to take me down now, let me fall.
And if it would ben- benefit the church to keep me alive, I'm willing to keep running. You willing to pray like that? Just make me free from hypocrisy. Help me to love my people with an absolutely authentic love. No game playing. Not showing up because you got to show up or anything like that. I don't know what battle you fight, but may the Lord free us. Love doesn't put up artificial fronts. Love doesn't dwell on the flaws of others to conceal our own. Love doesn't crave the praise of man. And love doesn't do the religious thing to hide the love of money. Love forgets itself, looks to Christ, overflows with joy, meets the needs of others.